so there's a there's a a moment in Nothing But Trouble where he takes his nose off and you see he doesn't mm. have a real nose. But his nose looks like a penis. So I'm wondering, are we to believe that he cut off his own penis in order to use that flesh to make his, to like a prosthetic nose? Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ! <laughs> it's like... You have crafted this backstory. <laughs> well, I mean... I guess it's more likely he cut off someone else's penis. <laughs> because that's a weird sacrifice to make. <laughs> yeah, sure it is. <laughs> I guess if you were thinking, like, I need to use dick flesh to craft a new nose, like, <laughs> why would you use your own? Well. kids are almost four and so most of what they watch is very like civically minded uh young viewer like toddler shows that are designed to like teach them about the structure of the day and about being a good person like paw patrol is all about like going and helping people it's about puppies <laughs> who each have a vehicle and there's like a there's a police dog and a fire dog and a trash dog and Trash, trash dog trash, over here. Trash dog is, is my nickname in high school. <laughs> He's got a recycling truck yeah. and like shit'll break and he'll pull trash out of the recycling truck and repurpose. Anyway, so yeah, when my kids watch that they don't make a peep. You can't get them to you can't like get their attention. And I gave them my old He-Man toys um, recently. Cause they were I had Castle Grace Call displayed in my living room because I'm a child. And I got it down. <laughs> and let them play with it. And they were very interested because I told them, you know, this is a show I used to watch when I was your age and I'm really into it. He-Man was my favorite thing when I was four. And uh, we found the old Master of the Universe cartoon on Hulu or some shit and I played it for them. And when they watch He-Man, they watch about nine seconds of each scene and then get up and run around and beat each other with sticks. Like they don't lock in, they don't pay that much attention. And they, but that was exactly what I did when I was a kid. Like I would watch just enough to like get a sense of the stupid fucking plot and then go around and, and, and mack it out. And so it's interesting that like, yeah, that vapid, almost completely plotless world building that went on in Master's Universe just sparks your imagination and makes you want to be He-Man. And you know, my kids are very young. Like that is happening like on some sort of really basic I think you've just level. defamed the entire 80s. You've just proven why none of those cartoons should have ever been on the air. Because <laughs> it, it triggers the fucking like, reptile brain of a three-year-old boy. <laughs> yes. Well, it does, but it also, like, I think all of my world-building skills and all of my, like, take this dumbass idea and turn it into something else and then, like, go explore that came from running around in the backyard with a stick stuck down my shirt being He-Man by myself. And, well, yeah, watching my kids do that now with the same exact stupid shit. There's a reason that we are all so invested. I mean, there's a reason that we're, you know, we're at Dragon Con. There's people running around in 35-year-old cartoon outfits. Because some, on some visceral level, they engage with that at an early age, and they'll love it more than anything forever. Yeah, and it takes you back to a place when, like, you could earnestly believe in something. Right. You know, and you aesthetically, like, connect those emotions to the way something looked. Right. And, you know, every generation has that. I mean, a little bit younger than us have Power Rangers. Um, for me, it's very... And I think it's probably because this is the only fucking channel we got when I was that, the age for this. But for me, it's Thundercats, Silverhawks, and He-Man. And those were all on the same channel. When you're a little kid, time is... You're, you're, like, your breadth of experience is so narrow that, like, six months is a really long amount of time. And as you get older, you know, it becomes a lot more different. And so, like, to me, Masters of the Universe was a huge part of my childhood. But it's just because I was three when it started and five or six when it ended. And so, you know, it was huge. But then, you know, now if something was popular, very popular for two years and then fell off, you'd be like, well, they fucked that up. I mean, there's whole seasons of Thundercats in my head that I'm still not sure exist. Thundercats blew up. It, it like, came in on the wake of Masters of the Universe and blew up on its own. And then the... the production company that made it was printing money so they're like well we'll do another one so they created Silverhawks but they didn't hire anybody else so then at that point they're making two with the same crew they're making two shows 
I mean, so Thundercats falls off in quality pretty hard, and Silverhawks is just fucking awful from the jump. Like, it's the same thing. It's cool ideas. I loved Silverhawks as a kid, but if you try to watch it now, like, the first episode is a training sequence on Earth. Like, they don't even go do anything interesting. It's just 20 minutes of them showing off, like, my elbows shoot lasers. <laughs> and then Monstar breaks out of jail, and that part's cool, but, like, the heroes are boring as fuck in the first episode. Monstar is awesome because he has a Cadillac that's made out of an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a sequence in the first episode uh, where he breaks out of jail and he goes up on his octopus and then it attacks him and he goes, You've gone wild! <laughs> he has to tame it. Monster, he's like a great character trapped in a shitty show. <laughs> yeah. And his, his, his transformation sequence is so cool and his, like the, everything about him is awesome. But he's surrounded by just the, the most useless henchmen and he's living in a world that doesn't make sense. Yeah, well, I, I lived in a suburb, and, you know, most of my friends lived in cul-de-sacs with other kids to play with. Well, we were far enough out that there was nobody. And so the fact that those shows, yeah, like, have really cool notions, but they're mostly just advertisements for toys, like the plots are really simple. You could go be that character and inhabit that character really easily and run with it. And I think, you know, that, yeah, it started telling stories because of that. I needed something to engage my mind because there were other people there. Which is absolutely what writing comics is. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like the best comics tend to be like when someone is given a, especially in like mainstream superhero stuff, is when someone's given a premise that they never, they may, they probably didn't connect with ultimately, like to begin with. But there's a, enough of a slate there. Yeah, I mean, it's really similar to being a little kid and pretending you're inside a fucking Thundercats world running around and flying them. There's a, there's a very thin line between being imaginative when you're a child and being a goddamn maniac. Yes. <laughs> like, that child has problems. Yeah, my whole thing is always about the humanity, of, like the, the shared experience of human life. Like, you'll... I'll go back and look at, at lettering drafts of stuff and realize, oh, I was just writing my own personal experience into this accidentally, and now I'm editing it like when I'm far enough removed that I can see that. It's a little bit embarrassing that like, my, my personal diary is like a Spider-Woman series. That I wrote. Nobody ever calls out the stuff that is actually autobiographical. They always assume that like, this character is a self-insert or this or that. They're always wrong. It's interesting because you and I both have like runs on female characters that happened at a time when the ground was very much shifting in comics as to like how much more we want straight my white men to tell us what women think. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of interesting new voices that are coming in. I don't know that either yeah, one of us get those jobs now. You know, I don't need. We probably should. No, I mean, we, maybe we shouldn't have the jobs in. But uh, so yeah, it, while I, yeah, your perspective is gained at the same time. Yeah, like maybe we didn't, nobody needs to know what the fuck we think about pregnancy. <laughs> when I got offered Spider Woman, it was like a fucking job. Yes, absolutely. Like I would have said yes to anything. I, and I like the character. I, I was ready to do it. But we launched that book in the middle of Spider Verse, which was a like writing an event crossover is a pain in the ass anyway. Launching a book in the middle of an event crossover is insane. And so when it came time post Spider Verse to like figure out what the book was actually going to be, I was very much like, this needs to be me. Like, this needs to be a book that, like, engages an idea that I'm interested in and takes the character in an interesting direction. And, like, I need to really get in the head of this person and figure out what I want to do with it. And so that's why we told a story about, like, Jessica Drew's tired of doing something for a living she can't explain to normal people. And so, like, it was, you know, like, she quit the Avengers and she wanted to just go, like, live a normal life and, and, and have something she could wrap her head around. Like, that was very meta for me, even though it's not totally one-to-one -one. and at that point yeah like I didn't ever want to tell any story with her that wasn't super personal for her at least if not for me I feel like if I'm going to continue working on you know popular media you know in that vein then I have a responsibility to explore like what is it like to be both privileged and at the same time like going through the same kind of garbage that everybody goes through. There's many times when I've just like wielded in a, and hurt someone's feelings just because I considered the playing field to be the same for everybody. Right. It's not even about equality in a way, it's just like that 
I considered my point of view to be the norm. Right. You know? And I just didn't even stop for a second to think, like... Well, that, that's the weirdest thing about having that, the, the newfound perspective on it, is we grew up being given our basic, our basic perspective 100% of the time. And then to realize that, like, oh, that was just bullshit. <laughs> but that should never have been the case. If you're a writer, you role play a lot. Like, you put yourself in other people's shoes. Right. And so, sometimes you don't even understand, like, why should I not right. tell that story? You know? I guess I don't think anything's off limits. I just think that there should be things that you better be damn sure you're prepared to, like, right. tackle. When the simple fact is, it's hard because it's also how we pay our bills. So saying no to a book when you don't have another book to replace it with or you don't know what's going to be offered on top of that is a little hard sometimes. But if you don't have a story to tell, you shouldn't take that job because somebody else will, right? So, like, yeah, that's it's one of the weird, challenging things about working in superhero comics is we have to produce stories at a crazy clip and we're offered jobs and you have to make a decision whether you want to do it, then pitch the book, and then be writing it in like a month and a half. It's so fast. But yeah, it's, it's hard to step back and be like, am I, am I the right person for this for any reason? And sometimes you, you do things in a way where like, you're, you're trying to be helpful right. and like, broaden the conversation, but ultimately maybe it's not your place to do it. Right. But you're up against a, a system where, I don't know, you have the opportunity to do it. And other people who have the same opportunity won't broaden that conversation. Right. It's also not you know, not your job to convince people you're earnest. You just yeah, like, exactly. do what you do, and they interact with it. Have you interact with it? You know, I mean, we alienate certain. We alienate some people with any story we tell because they're not going to relate to it, and that is just how it goes. Like you can't write a story exactly. that is that is meaningful to everyone, and that's their prerogative. You know, if someone who loves Spider Woman but doesn't want to read about motherhood isn't going to like that story. And it's, there's nothing I can do about that. Because that's, you know, I'm not speaking to them. I could not write that story, but then all of the people who did engage with it aren't engaged with it. So you just gotta, you just have to be earnest and to, no, I was thinking yeah. Ernest P. Worrell. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest P. Worrell or Ernest Goes to Camp? <laughs> the character. <laughs> so both. <laughs> Jokes about things that no one under 30 will remember. <laughs> 80, I think 80s movies are basically like hung around the premise of like, holy shit, we can make a cartoon that looks real? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think they got to a point in the 80s where they were like, fuck, we can make a prosthetic duck. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, we have to make this movie because we can make a duck walk around talking. Right. For you the know, first time. Yeah, exactly. Which is weird because that just kept going to the point that now they can literally do anything. Yeah, exactly. The, the massive bombs that were created by somebody who had a huge success and then was just allowed to do whatever the fuck. Like, Nothing But Trouble is the best example because Dan Aykroyd had done uh, at least Blues Brothers and maybe Ghostbusters at that point, what, right? So they're like, yeah, whatever. Like, Penis Nose Judge in a yeah. crazy carnival house. <laughs> Howard the Duck is George Lucas. Well, yeah. You know, and like Howard the Duck, in defense of Howard the Duck, is based on great source material. Yes. Like a book everyone loved of that generation. But of course he wanted to make that. Right. And it just didn't make any sense to the world at large at the time. Like nobody... At the time? <laughs> Does it make sense now? It's not a hard, high concept. It's just Daffy Duck in the real world or whatever. Oh, you said conceptually, not yeah. the actual yeah. what they made. Although I haven't seen what they made in so long that I don't remember. Yeah, well, me either. Sure, it's a delight. I know there's duck titties in it, which is strange. <laughs> it's a strange at the time. It's a strange concept. Drop the beat, Jay. Been all around the world. Been all around the world. I came for the party.
party to get naughty, get my rocks on, eat popcorn, watch you move your body to the pop song that I'm singing, ding a ringing, funky beats ringing, everybody swinging in the place as I kick the J-A-Z-Z-Y style, R&B, mixing it with the hip-hop swing beat, champagne in my hand, it won't be long till I'm gone, it's just the same old song. Oh, I'm young and...